Hello and welcome to today's book review. Today we're going to be reviewing Did Jesus Exist? The Historical Argument for Jesus of Nazareth by Bart D. Ehrman. Published in 2012 by Harper One, which is a division of Harper Collins. It's 361 pages long, including notes. Now, Bart D. Ehrman is the James A. Gray Distinguished Professor of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's the author of over 20 books and is considered an authority on the Bible and on the life of Jesus. Now, in the last several years, it's become quite uh, fashionable, if you will, to write books and claim that Jesus never existed, that he was a myth concocted way back in the early first century. Well, Dr. Ehrman lays out a case that Jesus has a greater likelihood to have actually existed than having been a myth. And he looks at ancient sources such as Josephus, Tatticus, and the life of the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul is an argument put forward by Dr. Ehrman as a reason to believe that Jesus existed. There's no serious debate about Paul being an actual living person. And as Saul of Tarsus, he was a serious and sometimes violent persecutor of Christians. And eventually, Saul of Tarsus heard of a group of Christians in Damascus. And at this point, as John MacArthur puts it, Saul was driven by a deadly and ambitious and twisted religious zeal, causing him to go to the high priest and ask for letters to the synagogue of Damascus. So that if he found any Christians, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, the high priest, in his capacity as president of the Sanhedrin, was viewed by the Romans as head of the Jewish state. So, according to MacArthur, the high priest had authority over Jewish internal matters, such as this one. Accordingly, Saul needed letters from him to the synagogue at Damascus to have authority to apprehend Christians. And Saul intended that if he found any, whether they were male or female, to bring them to Jerusalem. And then something happened on the way to Damascus. In Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 3, it tells us that as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, in chapter 5, which is entitled Two Key Data for the Historiosity of Jesus, Dr. Erdman makes this statement on page 157. Paul necessarily had close personal contact with the people he was persecuting. On one level or another, and what little he knew about Jesus at the outset of his outrage, in say 31 to 32 CE or so, would have been augmented by these contacts. These people themselves would have come to know what they knew about Jesus before Paul persecuted them. And so we can say with virtual certainty that there were Christians with information about Jesus from within a year or two, at the very latest, of the traditional date of his death. That Paul knew at least something about what those people were saying about Jesus. Now, the reference to CE, 31 to 32 CE, that's what we used to call AD, Anno Domino, in the year of our Lord. But since the advent of political correctness, we have to not use references to Jesus, so we use CE, Common Era, and then BCE is before Common Era. Now, chapter 6 and 7 are an examination of the mythical case of inventions wherein Erdman refutes the various reasons offered for Jesus not existing. Chapter 8 is Finding the Jesus of History. Now, from his introductory remarks to Chapter 8, it sounds like at the outset he tries to get students in his class to deny their faith, to, in other words, to talk them out of being Christians. Now, I could be wrong in that uh, assessment, but that's my takeaway from the first couple of chapters, uh, a couple of, uh, of uh, paragraphs of Chapter 8. And then chapter 9 is Jesus, the apocalyptic prophet, arguing that the oldest attainable sources contain clear apocalyptic teachings of Jesus. Strengths of this book. Well, the first strength I would point to is Dr. Erdman's scholarship. He grew up in Lawrence, Kansas and attended Lawrence High School and was on the school's 1973 state championship debate team. 
He then went on to the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, where in 1976 he was awarded a three-year diploma. He then went on to Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois, and then eventually earned his Ph.D. from Princeton Theological Seminary, where he studied under the late Bruce Metzger, who was one of the foremost biblical scholars of the 20th century. And his Ph.D., uh, Dr. Erdman's Ph.D., that is, was confirmed to him magna cum laude. And then there is the second strength, I would say, is the documentation. I'm a stickler about having good source references and good bibliography. He's got a five-page bibliography plus 14 pages of chapter notes at the end. And on page five, we see another strength. Dr. Erdman is a professed agnostic with atheistic leanings, yet he lets the evidence lead him to where the conclusion should be rather than start at the conclusion and work backwards, which is what a lot of Bible critics do. And then there's his writing style. Dr. Erdman's writing style is very easy to follow. You don't have to have a PhD in New Testament interpretation or in biblical languages. Anyone with a normal reading level can read it and understand it. And then he lays out a good summation of the case made by those who think Jesus was a myth before uh, refuting it and answering the arguments. Uh, Erdman also, as another strength, discusses the sources that a historian like him would use to arrive at his conclusions. In other words, he is looking at evidence about the person under discussion, not evidence from the person under discussion. And then he also takes a look at the lack of archaeological evidence and offers up some reasons why that's really not an issue. Now, what about the weaknesses of this book? Well, there, there are a few. For one, he relies on what's known as the documentary hypothesis, he relies on Q, L, and M, and source criticism. Now, what does all that mean? Well, briefly stated, source criticism is the search for the original sources that lie behind a given biblical text. And he relies on things such as the Q source, the L source, the M source. All this started back in the 1800s by some German theologians. And the first letter in the German word for source is Q. Hence the name Q source. Now, the problem with this Q source is it's never been proven to exist. Neither has the source L or M or any of those other alleged sources. The belief is that Mark was the oldest gospel and that he got his information from oral and written traditions that we just don't have anymore. And so they were dubbed the Q source. And that Matthew and Luke used Mark uh, source as the basis for their gospels. But there have been no fragments, there have been no full manuscripts for any of these other sources. So my contention as to why they are never cited by early biblical writers and church fathers is they just never existed in the first place. That Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John got their information from what a friend of mine once called the G source, which is God. And they were divinely inspired to write uh, what they did. Another weakness of the book is there is no topical index. This is a pet peeve of mine for books of this nature. If I want to be able to look up, say, the references to John the Baptist, I'd like to be able to go to the back of the book, scroll down, find John the Baptist, okay, he's on page whatever, and then go to that page to see what the author has to say about John the Baptist. Can't do that in this book because it's not there. So if you ever write a book like this, here's a tip. Put in some kind of a topical index. Another help would be uh, an index of scriptures that are cited and what page that they might be found on. And then another weakness is he rejects or he downplays clear Bible teaching. Now, the Bible's pretty clear on a lot of things, and we can't reject it. It is God's Word. Now, on page 237, Ehrman states that Jesus is exalted to a position worthy of of equal position with God only after he is raised, and the emphasis is on the original. But here's some scriptures that I've listed that show that what he says is not true, that Jesus in fact was exalted to a position equal to God and accepted worship while he was on the earth, before he went to the cross. So to say that Jesus uh, didn't accept worship or that he wasn't regarded as deity until after uh, his death is simply wrong. And then in the conclusion, Erdman makes some statements that are either wrong from a biblical standpoint 
or they are unprovable. For instance, page 335, he says, So far as we know, Jesus expressed no opinion on the ethical issues that plague us today. Abortion, reproductive rights, gay marriage, euthanasia, or bombing Iraq. His world was not ours, his concerns were not ours, and most striking of all, his beliefs were not ours. Well, let's have a look at this. Let's look at the ethical issues that are addressed biblically. When it comes to abortion, or so-called reproductive rights, there is no word for fetus in biblical Hebrew. The words, when, you, when they're looking at the unborn, is the same word that gets translated as child. So, and this is just a thumbnail description of it. From what the New Testament and, in Greek and the Old Testament say, we can conclude that the unborn are just as human in God's eyes as you and I are, and that to uh, abort a child is considered murder. Marriage. Did Jesus have anything to say about gay marriage? Well, according to popular religious thought, nah, he never said anything about it. That's incorrect. Matthew chapter 19, Jesus is asked a question about divorce. And can a man divorce his wife for any reason? And notice in Jesus' answer, he goes back to the beginning to say that God made them male and female. Thus a man shall leave his parents and cleave to his wife. Notice, male and female, and Jesus went back to the beginning. Now this is what we would call the law of exclusion. Jesus said when a man and a woman, and by doing that Jesus excluded all other possibilities for marriage. So two men, not a marriage. Two women, not a marriage. A man and multiple women, that's not a marriage. A woman and multiple men, not a marriage. It's one man and one woman under the Christian covenant. So Jesus did talk about that. Now what about euthanasia? Well, as practiced by, say, the British National Health Service, which in early 2018 put uh, two babies to death, wouldn't even allow their parents to pay out of their own pocket to take them to the United States or somewhere else for treatment, that's simply wrong. Now, for a person to make an informed choice and decide, I want a, a DNR, a do not resuscitate order, or something like that, that's different. But to take a person's life against their will without inf their informed consent, you don't find any biblical support for that. Finally, it's not quite accurate to say that his concerns were not our concerns. Some of the concerns that they had back in Jesus' day and before are the exact same concerns we have today. People worried about uh, raising their children, worried about giving their children a good life. They worried about war from neighboring countries. They had the economic concerns. All those things that we have today, they had back then. So it's not exactly accurate to claim that uh, uh, his worries and, and concerns were not ours. Overall, it is a good book as a reference source. You have to exercise some caution and be wary about some of the claims that he makes uh, regarding biblical teaching. So I'd like to hear what you think especially if you've read the book. Feel free to leave a comment uh, below, or you can email me if you'd like uh, uh, to do a private email exchange or ask a question, 2timothy4.2.3 at gmail.com. Thanks a lot for watching, and we will see you in the next video.